Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you're brand new to First Pres, uh, if you could fill out a white card in the pew pocket in front of you, uh, drop that in the offering plate a little bit later as they go by, and uh, that way we can keep you up to date uh, with everything that's happening here at church and pray for you and do all those wonderful things. Um, as people continue to, uh, to to flow into church, it's a good reminder that um, the, the, the seats that might seem really empty right now might not seem very empty to somebody who comes in a little bit later. So as you're able, please kind of scooch in, maybe make sure there's a, an empty space on the outside of the pew for, for that last last minute person who's coming in. Um, we want to make sure we're, we're warm and inviting to everyone. Uh, but we do have a lot going on at church, and so I would ask everyone who has an announcement to kind of be up here staged, ready to go, but I'll invite uh, my dear brother David Dreidoppel to uh, tell us about uh, Presbytery that just concluded yesterday. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Pastor David and myself just returned from Wenatchee, Washington, uh, where we had the, uh, was a day and a half or two days of, of Presbytery meetings, um, and he asked me to begin with a very brief synopsis of what uh, what we did. Um, as I said, it was at Saddle Rock EPC in Wenatchee, Washington. Uh, on Thursday, Thursday afternoon was the mission uh, or the world outreach uh, meeting. Uh, meet for a few hours to talk about world missions. The theme uh, of the day was what is the future of missions? It was based with a, a panel of six of our world outreach workers discussing what the future of missions looks like for the EPC is based on a report done by the Barna organization. Um, I was able to meet with our world outreach workers that we support, uh, Mike and Tammy Niga, who are missionaries to Malaysia, and I was able to meet with uh, Andy Ekblad, uh, whom we also support, who is continuing his, uh, his work training pastors in Africa. Uh, so I was able to sit and have time with each of them and find out their needs and their prayer requests. And I'll talk a little bit about the MIGA's specific prayer requests here a little bit later on. Um, and uh, so then on Friday, we started our meeting, of course, with, with worship and with prayer. Uh, David and I decided that someone needs to volunteer to learn to play the mandolin. They had a, they had a mandolin player. <laughs> Melissa's already volunteered. I don't play but give me a couple of Okay. But every every report, every portion of the meeting is is begun and ended with prayer. Uh, it's a very worshipful experience. Um, we heard from uh, Gabriel de Goya from the World Outreach. He provided the topic uh, uh, and the, the, the opening worship message. Um, and then we heard from two different pastors, or two different candidates for ordination, uh, one from uh, New Hope Church in Kent, Washington, young man by the name of Ruben Antivillink. Uh, he gave a short sermon and was examined and was approved uh, for ordination as an assistant pastor at New Hope EPC in Kent, Washington. After lunch, we heard from uh, the president of Whitworth College, um, who has some ties to the EPC. Some, um, the, the EPC normally has a, a pastor on the board of Whitworth, and so uh, through those connections, he came and spoke with us um, about the work being done at, at Whitworth. Uh, and then after lunch, there was another examination of a candidate for ordination to a church in uh, Tacoma, to the Parkway EPC, and, and that pastor, or that individual was also approved for ordination as an assistant pastor uh, at Parkway. We heard, we heard reports on world missions, church planting, church health, and the evening ended with uh, worship and a dinner. Told you I'd keep it short. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic gathering, and once again, we, we thank you, uh, our congregation, for uh, 
continuing to support uh, our session, our, our ruling elders and, and myself, your teaching elder, in sending us to these really vital gatherings of the church. Um, it was kind of exciting. Um, Pastor Andy Ekblad and Pastor Dave Moody were both there, and were both at the same table that Dave Dreopel and I were at for, for most of the meeting, and so it was really great to catch up with them. Uh, it, was just, it was a sweet time of, of fellowship and worship and you know, also getting the, the business of Presbytery done. And so uh, we bring greetings from, from Dave Moody and Andy and Mary Ekblad. Um, they were both, um, you know, as always, very loving and, and wanted to, to communicate their, their warmth and their love to y'all, uh, whom they miss dearly. Other announcements. Christina has a special, uh, a special invitation for us. Um, so <clears throat> last year I had a very wild year with God and he worked in miraculous and just crazy ways um, and it's a really long story and it's a story that only gives God the glory when I have the time to share all the details and I've been promising for the last year that at some point I would share that all with you and um, for whatever reason through prayer and whatnot I feel like the time is right and so um, I'm inviting you all on June 9th at 4 p.m. here, so late afternoon on a Sunday. Um, if you want to come back to church for the second time in one day, uh, to come join and hear the whole story. It's a story of how I ended up donating a kidney to someone I <clears throat> hadn't spoken to in like 15 years um, through a lot of just wild answered prayers. And I'm going to have photos, so it'll be hopefully captivating. You can kind of actually put faces to names and whatnot. Um, it's just a beautiful story that in my opinion answers the questions like is there a god and if there is a god what's he like he is love um it's it's amazing and it's not mine i feel like the story isn't mine it's the lord's and that's and i felt very convicted that i need to share it so i'm excited to finally get to do that um and my only other thing that i would mention about it is <clears throat> One of the reasons it's been hard to share is because it is pretty vulnerable and personal. Um, and it's been really awkward for me after donating when I run into people who just hear in passing, like, hey, you're an amazing person. Heard about your kidney. And I'm like, oh, like it's, I'm like, no, you have to hear the whole story because it's not about me or my glory. It's the glory is meant to be to God. And so I am happy to have anyone here. Everyone is welcome to come. Um, and I would ask you to even pray about maybe inviting someone in your life who's open to God, but isn't really sure. I think it's a really encouraging story. Um, just to show that God is real again. But um, I guess my advertising of it is like word of mouth and email and in the church bulletin, but I'm not, I don't feel comfortable like having it like a Facebook event or posting it around town because that's just more announcing the fact I donated a kidney and not necessarily getting to tell people the whole story, which again, if, if someone's willing to hear the whole story, I am so excited to tell it, but if it's just them finding out that I did this thing, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. So, yep, thank you. <laughs> okay, June 9th, 4 p.m., right here invite friends. Thank you, Christina. Can't wait. Nicole? Good morning, First Pres. I'm Nicole Matthews, the Young Adult Director. If you have a student who is graduating in any capacity, kindergarten, eighth grade, high school, trade school, graduate school, college, whatever, and you would like them to be recognized and or celebrated, that celebration will take place Sunday, May 26th. So let Karina or I know if you have a student who wants to participate. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? There's more to read about in your bulletin, but uh, for now, take a moment to uh, prepare your hearts and minds and then stand for the call to worship. Good morning, my church family. I love you all so very much, and I'm so happy to be here uh, doing worship service with you. And I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all you moms, and also a recognition of Happy Mother's Day to all those dads who have taken on the role of mother in their lives in whatever circumstances. I especially think of my brother-in-law, Jeff, who, um, 21 years ago when my sister passed away took on the role of being mom to his two children so God bless you dads as well as all your moms please join me in the call to worship make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth to his presence with singing know that the Lord he is God it is he who made us and we are his 
We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Give thanks to God, bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And let's join the worship team in singing, Oh, How I Need You, and the stand. And forgive me if I start to cry, because they always make me cry. I brought my Kleenex and Kathleen goes, oh, good. <laughs> Where I find you in the seeking, Lord, I find you in the doubt, and to believe is to love you and to know so little else I need you.
is so beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I pity the people who sit in front of me or behind me when I sing because I know I can't sing. But there's always the knowledge that one day when I get to heaven, I'll be able to sing and it will sound good. Please join me in the confession of sin. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. And just take a silent moment to confess your personal sins. Hear the good news. Christ Jesus came into our world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. That way we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And join us and take my life. Here I am. Take my life and let me be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moment. Thank <laughs> you. 
So it's a time in our service of the passing of the peace. And I say it every time I'm up here, I pray God's peace uh, carries you throughout the rest of your day and throughout the coming week until we come again next week and do it all over again. May the peace of Christ be with you. This time it's my fault. I was like the last one standing up. Speaking of my fault, um, I also forgot to say Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for covering, Michelle. Um, uh, and you know, it's it's not a church holiday, um, and and people have different feelings about it, right? Not not everyone has a, a wonderful relationship with their mother. There can be some some hurt there, and so we don't we don't make a point of it. We don't preach a, a Mother's Day sermon, uh, but we do want to honor uh, the women in our lives um, who who have been motherly or shown motherly love um, and so uh, at the end of service um, we have some folks uh, Nancy and some of our, our little uh, younger volunteers are going to be passing out gifts uh, to women uh, just to say thank you and happy Mother's Day so there's that um, please let us continue to worship God by presenting our tithes and offerings I'm finding myself at a loss for words and a 
funny things It's okay The last thing I need Is to be heard But to hear What you would say Word of God speak What you pour down God, we praise you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks that we have the opportunity to be here with the brothers and sisters in Christ that you have placed in our lives, that we might be this body of Christ as part of the larger body of Christ around the world, the communion of saints. And we have so much to give thanks for. And even in the midst of that, we have so much to do, so much that you call us to do. And so, God, we ask that these gifts might be signs of our obedience, our willingness to follow you out into the world, loving others, welcoming them, welcoming them into the community of faith, that all might be a part of this body of Christ and know the saving name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What is God up to in your life? If you have a joy or concern that we can be joining you with in prayer today and all week long, please raise your hand. I just like prayers for um, good friends of ours, uh, Willie and Gabriella. Willie is going through um, acute 
uh, myeloid like leukemia as well as another bone marrow disorder and they're down at Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester but um, yesterday he developed an infection um, so he's gone through one round of chemo which has basically killed his immune system and now he's fighting a bacterial infection um, their daughter Celestina is a year older than Kyle and um, it's just my heart's groaning for them there's nothing I can do but um, but pray and cry out to God um, that they would get every moment, every um, second together um, would be meaningful and that God would move in powerful ways. Um, Willie's a wildland firefighter and um, if God moved in miraculous ways, it would be just an incredible testimony to a community that often wants to respond and fix and do things and we're all feeling helpless right now. And so what an opportunity to to show God's power um, while well, we're powerless. Let's pray. Um, God, we, we lift up Willie and his wife and his daughter as well. And as, as Amber said, God, we ask for you to move in his life. Um, we think about wildland firefighters. Most of us here in Fairbanks, if we've been here a little while, we, we probably know a few. And uh, they're bold and they're strong. And uh, they, uh, they want to do stuff. Um, they want to address the problems in front of them. And it's, it's got to be hard for Willie and, and for so many, uh, so many folks that love and know Willie um, to not feel like they can do anything, to know that he's in the hands of the doctors and in, in your hands, God. And so we ask um, that you would be uh, working in Willie's life and his body, um, clearing this infection, um, and also clearing the cancer. God, that, uh, that whether it would be healthy and strong, uh, that he could give praise to you for that. Um, and, and God, we pray for those doctors as well. Um, we, we ask that you be guiding their minds and their hands as they seek to, to bring healing to Willie. Um, and, and God, frankly, we're not picky, right? We, we ask for healing um, th through your hand, through the doctor's hand, or through your hand on the doctor's hand. Um, but um, all the same, we, we lift up Willie in Jesus' name, and we ask that uh, he could give you thanks too. Amen. Other folks? So I have a, a brother four years younger than myself who had epilepsy since he was probably four. And uh, drugs are no longer controlling his seizures. So I'm going, I'm leaving Tuesday to go back to uh, Mayo in Rochester um, as he undergoes what they call invasive monitoring. In other words, they will explore regions of his brain to see if there's something they can do uh, maybe surgically to alleviate his, his seizures. So pray for me, pray for him, pray for the doctors. God, we, we lift up Alan. Um, we ask that, uh, that you would be, again, uh, working a miracle here. And God, we pray for Paul as he, as he travels to, to be with Alan and, and just to be that, that comforting presence. God, we pray for that time to be, to be meaningful, to be a, a beautiful and sweet time of, of brotherly love and, and catching up and, and finding your strength in the midst of, of a difficult time. Um, but God, we, we pray for Alan. We pray for this, this next treatment to, to be solving something, to be, to be healing something that has not been solved, not been healed for all of Alan's life. Um, and God, we ask that it would be done in your name, and we ask that your name would be glorified, um, that Alan can give you thanks, uh, even as, as Paul is there uh, loving his brother and, and praying for him as well. Um, so, so God, we pray for Paul in his travels, and we pray for Alan as he undergoes this treatment. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Other folks? <laughs> I'm assuming you weren't just standing up to... No, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Mike and Tammy Miga, who are world outreach workers that we support, uh, travel to Malaysia. Uh, right now they're on a sabbatical uh, a time back in the States uh, for about six months. They are looking for prayer because of some visa problems. 
they're not quite sure if they're going to be able to renew their visas they would like to be able to renew them for a six year period but they're not even sure if they're going to be able to get a visa so they would just like our prayers I can Tammy Tammy can Tammy thank you Lord God we, we lift up Mike and Tammy and it was wonderful to see them and um, to, to hear more about their ministry at Presbytery we give you thanks that they have um, us <laughs> our our community of believers here in our little corner of um, the denomination um, who support them and pray for them and uh, look to those updates and God we, we pray for for Mike and Tammy that um, there would be a way forward um, in their in their work um, and they they've left this in your hands you know they, they said you know if this is the time then this is the time and if it's not the time God will make it clear and so God we ask that you would be making it clear and we ask that you would be um, renewing their call uh, to the people of Malaysia, that they could continue to, to love those neighbors that they have, uh, to continue the, the mission work that they have begun, and um, that they could welcome people into your presence, Jesus, um, and, and that those, those people in Malaysia would know your goodness, your truth, your love, your salvation. And uh, God, we ask that you'd continue to use Mike and Tammy as your kingdom workers. In Jesus' name, amen. Michelle? I just want to ask for prayers on behalf of the Hulls. They are all dealing with sickness and colds and not being very well, and they are getting ready to leave early Wednesday morning to fly out to visit family and especially her grandmother. But yeah, they're all pretty sick, so, and to travel with five babies and not feeling good is not fun at all. So just prayers for the Hulls. God, we pray for the whole family. Um, as, as much as they've endured this winter, God, we, we ask for the smaller thing, for healing, uh, for health and wellness, uh, especially as they get ready to travel with, with five kids across the continent. Um, God, we just ask that you'd be giving them strength and energy and, and totally healed and well bodies, um, that they could enjoy that travel, enjoy that time with family, and not uh, suffer from any lingering colds or infections, but just, uh, God, we ask for, for health and, and wellness and good trips, good travel uh, for the whole family. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, last chance. I have a prayer request. Um, as uh, Dave Dredoppel mentioned, uh, we had two candidates uh, that were uh, evaluated um, and examined and then uh, approved for ordination, and that's uh, Reuben and Mike. And uh, Reuben was there uh, a year ago when I was examined and was uh, about to, to start his exams and, and do all those things. And so he and I met and I actually kind of helped, helped him study for some of his written exams and you know was one of the many pastors that helped kind of coach him and encourage him. And uh, not so much with Mike, just because we didn't have that same connection. I didn't have the opportunity to, to talk or work with Mike as much, but um, we just ask that we be praying for both of them as they, they start their ordained ministry. Um, and uh, I have, looking back on almost a year of ordained ministry myself, I have so much to look back and be thankful for, and uh, would pray that they would have the same thing a year from now. So, God, we lift up Reuben and Mike. Um, we ask that you would bless them as they... Uh, as they became ordained ministers of your word and your sacraments, um, God, bless them. Bless the congregations that they serve. Help them to, to be leaders, teaching elders um, in our denomination. And may they continue to know that they have sisters and brothers in Christ, fellow pastors, and entire congregations that are praying for them in Jesus' name, um, hoping and, and looking forward to all the ways that they will succeed in their ministry and, and bring fruit uh, as you have ordained. Uh, so God, in, in, in Jesus' name, we pray for Reuben and for Mike, these new pastors in our presbytery. And God, we, we pray for all those things on our hearts right now. God, we, we celebrate mothers, and we celebrate those who are looking forward to becoming mothers. And we celebrate all the women in our life who show motherly love. God, even in your own word, you are described as, as a mother hen who longs to gather all her chicks together. Jesus describes his love for Jerusalem the same way. And so we know that motherly love is godly. 
It's an aspect of you and your love for us. And so, God, we, we want to celebrate that, and we give you thanks. And we ask that you would be with those who have, who have pain related to, to motherhood. Um, there's, there could be a lot of pain there. And so, God, we ask that you would be holding those people close, helping them to, to know that you are with them even in the midst of that pain or that struggle, and that your love continues for them even where there is pain or woundedness. God, we ask that you would bring healing love. And God, we pray for those parts of the world that are severely lacking in justice and in love and in peace. God, we ask that you would be making peace in those places, that you would be bringing justice to those places, that you would be sending your love to those places, and that we, as Christians, would be the first to carry peace and love and justice to those places. And we pray that um, for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are actively living in those places or, or bringing mission and, and, and service work to those places. God, we, we lift up Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Yemen, Syria, Sudan, Burma, Myanmar, all those places right now, God, where there is a severe lack of the basic needs for the people and a severe lack of the love and justice that we try to, to bring about in our own churches, in our own lives, in our own communities. And God, we, we lift up those prayers that were not said out loud today, those prayers on our hearts that you know. We know that you hear them. We know that you hold us close in the midst of our prayers. And Lord God, we pray that way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us these debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, kids stay seated. We have some special music, and then it'll be time for the children's sermon. Teach me your way. 
stay for a while with you. Just you and me together all alone. I'm going to ask the Sunday school teachers to come up for just a second. So Amber, and I don't know where Brian went, and Christy and Miss Marta, if you would come up for just a second. So today is the last day of Sunday school for the year. We run our programs during the school year because, mostly because, well, two reasons. A lot of you are all traveling, and so the classes get smaller, but also because our Sunday school teachers need a little breather, and summer is the best time to do that. Um, <laughs> No big speeches except to say that my Sunday school teachers have been amazing, have dedicated every Sunday this, this year to be regular teachers. Um, in, in the past, we have switched off and kind of shared the job over the course of the year, but we decided it would be better for the kids if we were, had like one person every week, the same teacher that could get, them, get to know them better over time. And um, they have given up a ton of time and I will say that they are some of the busiest people I know. And so I'm very grateful to have them here. Um, tiny little gifts to say thank you. As very busy people, I thought that these three could use something childlike as a reminder of God's love for them. So these are Bible coloring books. So that when you are stressed out and trying hard to remember that you're a child of God, here's your reminder. Hey, yeah, and I've got a little reminder for Brian too. Although I'm, Brian, you're getting a, a map because I know that that is something that you and the kids will enjoy together. So, thank you so much, and God bless you. You guys are awesome. Now, if I could have my Roots students come forward, please. I know not all of them could be here today, so it's going to look a little smaller than it actually is. But if you could stand right up here, Kayla. And there's two more. Okay. Uh, our Roots Club is a meeting that we have weekly um, on Sunday nights. They come back to church, believe it or not, and we eat a meal together. And then this year we have been studying uh, the temple and the tabernacle. So sort of getting the foundations of God, who he says he is, and how he wants us to worship. Um, Throughout that, I'm going to hand out certificates to all of them, but I also issued a couple challenges this year. If you would like to tell me all 66 books of the Bible, then we can add a little star to your thing if you meet that challenge. And then if you would like to test yourself and your knowledge from this year, then if you pass the test, then you get another star on your thing just to acknowledge your extra effort and your desire to meet that challenge. But I will tell you that all of the kids have been faithful attenders, have participated in talks about what is heaven like, and why do bad things happen, and what, what, what is the Ark of the Covenant? And I have been, um, I've enjoyed them a lot. So 
I am excited to present certificates today. Let's see. So I'm going to start with Annie Romanowski. Congratulations, Annie, on completing a year of training. Yay. Uh, Caleb Sunderland, congratulations on completing a year of training. I have a bunch of absentees. Um, my daughter's sick today. Um, Ellie and Nathaniel Hull um, also were attenders. And uh, Ellie went ahead and did the All 66 star and the Study Star star. So she, those are on her certificate. Um, Allison Smith, as well, has memorized all 66 books of the Bible. And gone the extra mile and passed a, a challenge test. And Eric, I don't know why I didn't put the stickers on yours, because I got distracted, I guess. But Eric has also um, done the study star and passed a test to prove that he learned all this stuff this year. So way to meet a challenge, and I'll sign that later. <laughs> They're an excellent group, and I'm very grateful for them. Good job, you guys. You did great. All right. You can stay up here if you like. All right. And now it's time for the children's sermon. So everybody else, come on up. That's the map that's going to your house, yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, you know, we always talk about what it is that David's going to talk about, Pastor David is going to talk about. And I believe, if I'm gathering correctly, that he's going to talk about what it's like to be the family of God and to receive good things from God and then to share them with each other and to share them with even more people. Because that's what we always do, right? When you get something good from God, you share it with other people. That's how God wants us to live. Now, follow-up question. Have any of you been to a museum? Raise your hand. <gasps> what museum have you been to? Children's Museum is a great one. What about you? Museum of the North. And the Seward Museum. What about you, Avery? Where have you been? The Children's Museum. What about you? The UAF Museum. Where have you been? The Children's Museum and another Children's Museum? Two of them? Oh, a train museum. That's really cool. Where have you been, Juniper? Where? Mount Thompson. Is that right? Oh. Can you want to say it for me so I get it ready? What's the name of your museum? I forgot the name. But you were there, and that's what counts. Do you want to tell me a museum you've been to? By the Jesus died on the cross. He did die on the cross. That is perfectly right, Constance. And Constance has been to a museum. Have you been to a museum theater? What? Have you been to a museum? I saw your hand up. No. no? Okay, I'm going to go really quick, and I'd like you to say the museum you went to. The Louvre. Louvre. Oh, jealous. What museum have you been to? Anchorage Museum. Oh, have you been to a museum? Yeah. Where? Uh, it's Children's Museum. Oh, the Children's Museum. Where did you go? Um, the Children's Museum? Yes. I didn't do the Anchorage Museum. Oh, good one. What about you? I don't know what it's called. <laughs> She's definitely been to a museum. Now, thank you for sharing. And how blessed are we to have the Children's Museum? Because there was a lot of that going on up here. When we go to a museum, we go to see things that are really cool and to celebrate how, they cool, how cool they are and to, to learn about them, right? And sometimes at really cool places like the Children's Museum, you get to pick stuff up and touch it, experience it, learn about it. Well, I'm starting a museum. And you guys are going to supply all the stuff that goes in it. I'm starting a museum called the Museum of Good. It's all the good things that we see this summer that God has given us. And we're going to take those things and put them in a special room downstairs every week this summer so that you can come and see the good things God has done and shown you. And so you can share those things with each other and maybe with your grown-ups and the rest of the congregation. So we're going to have a real museum. And like 
I bought this rock because it's a really cool rock. It has a line through the middle that's made of a totally different kind of thing. So you have something that looks like it used to be sand, and then something that looks like it used to be a different kind of mineral that makes a line right through the middle. And I think it's really cool, so I'm going to put it in the museum. And next to New Rock, there's going to be a little sign that says, on loan from Miss Karina. And it's going to sit on the shelf. Now, there's other things that could go in the museum. If you find a cool rock, you can put something like that in there. Or if you make something. My children made this. This is a really cool doll that was a character I really liked in one of our games. And another kid made this little sculpture of a polar bear. So that could go in our museum. And another kid made, oh, my daughter made a painting of some really cool things we found. Now, you can put anything in the museum as long as you find it in nature or made it yourself. Thank you very much. So Sunny's made us something cool. Put it on me from Sunny. So do you understand? What are the two kind of things you can bring? You can bring things that you find in where? Nature. So anything you find in nature or anything that was made by who? You. Now, adults, if you feel like you've brought, you, you found something amazing and you can get a child to sponsor you, you can put something in the museum. But you must be sponsored. So this is a real thing. We're going to do this all summer long. Uh, we want to share the good things we find that God has shown us. After church each Sunday, I will be collecting things downstairs and in the classrooms and displaying them, and everybody can come down and look at what the children have brought. And we might even have some challenges over the summer. Go and find the best of this. So, do you think you can bring cool things to share with other people? Yeah? All right. Because when God shows us cool things, then we should show each other, and we should share them. All right, I'm going to pray for you. Ready to pray? Hands to yourself. All right. Thank you, Jesus, for all these kids, for a great year of Sunday school, and for the really fun summer ahead. I pray safety on all these guys. No broken legs. No swimmer's itch. Only good days. We pray all this in Jesus' name. We pray that your love would spread from them to all their friends and throughout our whole community. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we just finished Presbytery. And a year ago, at the same May scheduled presbytery, was my floor exam, which means we're coming up on a year anniversary of my ordination. And, you know, one of the things that pastors, especially pastors that are kind of there to help check on you as a new pastor, ask how things are going, and, you know, they talk about things like the honeymoon period. And, you know, you know, basically the honeymoon period, depending on who you ask, is either a, a, a period of, of extra sweetness and care and, and love and just everybody's excited. I'm excited to be with my new church and the church has decided to have their new pastor. And, well, it's like, well, David's kind of already been there, so I don't know if there's going to be a honeymoon period or not. Um, here's how I know maybe there's still a little bit of a honeymoon period going. Nobody told me I forgot to put my collar on this morning. Uh, I just... Like, literally, as Karina's wrapping up the kids' sermon, I, I, I happened to kind of brush past my neck and realize it wasn't there. So I apologize. I simply forgot to put it on this morning. Um, my wife did not tell me that either, so maybe I'm still in the honeymoon period with her, too. I don't know. We'll be talking a little bit more about community and life together in our sermon today, but first, let's hear the Word of God. First, from 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 9. The Apostle writes, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself or herself. Whoever does not believe God has made God a liar or 
has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Our next reading is from John chapter 17, beginning at verse 6. Jesus is speaking to his Holy Father. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All of mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they, they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and these things that I speak in the world that they have may and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also might be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are nearing the end of this Easter series. In fact, next Sunday is technically not uh, part of Easter. Next Sunday is the new season, the season of Pentecost. And uh, I will not be here, unfortunately. I, I will be gone next Sunday, but James Menneker is going to be preaching another excellent sermon. And uh, I look forward to hearing it uh, either via uh, Facebook Live or YouTube. Um, and uh, I will be missing y'all next week. But um, this is the, the last Sunday of the Easter season. Uh, Pentecost is the, the beginning of of the new season. It's, it's really the beginning of the church, the beginning of the Christian church, the birthday of the church as the Holy Spirit comes and fills the disciples, fills the disciples that they might speak in tongues, in different languages, that they might speak, most importantly, about Jesus to people who have never heard. And those people receive what they are being told about Jesus, are baptized not in the way of John's baptism, but are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. And the church is unleashed on the world. Okay, I debated about saying this, but I, you know, on the off chance that it becomes something that, that you can use in your own life or that reminds you of something biblical, I'm going to say it. I kind of debated about whether or not to do this. Ascension Day uh, was during, I think it was Thursday, it's another part of the church calendar, um, and sometimes this would be Ascension Sunday, but we're not super liturgical, we're kind of medium liturgical, 
But anyway, Ascension Sunday is, is the day that we celebrate um, Jesus ascending into heaven, re- returning to the Father, um, completing all of the work that he has done uh, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, uh, and is, being, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. The, the most recent meme I saw of that was uh, Ascension Day is uh, Jesus beginning his, his work from home, uh, his work from home program there seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, maybe he's got a really nice laptop. I don't know. Anyway, Ascension Sunday in German, and as you know, I, I have good, strong German Lutheran roots, is called Himmelfart. All right, there you go. If, nothing, if you remember nothing else about the sermon today, you can remember Himmelfart. And that comes from the German, Himmel meaning heaven, and Fart with an H, is uh, from foreign to travel. It's, it's traveling to heaven, okay? And I have a lot of Lutheran pastors that like to giggle and talk about that every time this year. But the reason I tell you that, other than may, maybe getting a couple Snickers out of the uh, congregation here, is the story in Acts chapter 1 is actually kind of powerful. Uh, it echoes what we see in, in the other uh, resurrection stories. Um, but... The, the last moment is, is my favorite part. Jesus has said, I am sending the advocate. You will receive the Holy Spirit soon, but until then, remain in Jerusalem. Um, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be speaking my gospel, right? You'll start in Jerusalem. You'll go to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that is both a prophecy saying this is going to happen, and it's also instructions. It's also an assignment, Right? And it all comes true. But in the meantime, as, as, as Jesus is returning to the Father, and I don't know what that looks like, if it's literally like a cloud, right? And sometimes that cloud really brings to mind the presence of God in the Old Testament, right? The pillar of cloud that leads the people out of slavery, out of Egypt. Uh, the cloud that, that knocks all the Levite priests down on their faces uh, in the presence of the Lord, right? That is what we mean by cloud, right? But the cloud comes, Jesus is gone, and the disciples are all just kind of standing there like, what happens next? And they're just struck in awe. They're so struck in awe that God has to send an angel or two, two men clothed in dazzling white, just like the ones that were there at the empty tomb, to say, men of Galilee, what are you doing? Standing around with your mouths open. Go back to Jerusalem like he told you to do. We're going to see how we can be just like the disciples, standing there, mouths slack-jawed, in awe of all that God has done. But God has more for us to do than just stand there. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your word, for the chance to, to hear it and study it together today. And God, even though the little piece of white plastic that reminds me and my congregation that in this office of pastor, I'm speaking the word of God, the holy truth in the midst of my depravity, God asked that I would still be able to do that, even without that little piece of white plastic. May I speak your word today, Lord, and may they hear your word today, Lord, and everything else that is not your word, may it fall to the ground and be crushed underfoot, but may your word remain, preserve, and keep us in your love, Jesus. Amen. We're at the end, or very near to the end of 1 John in our reading today, that first reading from the first letter of John to the church. And he makes it clear. He says, I am writing this so that you might know that you have eternal life. He is not writing this as an evangelistic tool. This is not like the Gospel of Mark, perhaps, which is meant to introduce people to Jesus. This is a letter written to the church assuring them that they are secure in their salvation in Christ because they bear that name. Of Jesus, because they believe in that name of Jesus, because they have endured suffering on behalf of the name of Jesus. John is writing to the church, telling them, You are doing good. Stay in that love. 
Keep believing in that name of Jesus Christ. You are secure in your salvation. And salvation is great. Salvation is something we should absolutely rejoice in and give thanks and worship God on behalf of all that we have received as a part of our salvation. But our salvation is not the end of our faith. It is not the goal of our faith. Our salvation is the beginning of who we are as Christians. It's the beginning of our work as those who trust in the name of Jesus. One of the old metaphors for the church, or a critique of the church, is a foot race. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an invitation for everyone to come and join the foot race. doesn't matter if you're racing, sprinting the whole way, or, or taking that a nice steady jog, a light jog, or maybe you're just walking it. And everyone is invited to join in the race. But then when it comes time to start the race, there's, you know, about half, half the folks are lined up at the start line, and the other half have already decided, you know, we're just going to cheer on those racers. You know, my job isn't so much to run the race as it is to cheer those who are racing it on. And then the gun goes off, and the race starts, and a few people are out the gate real quick, and a few others immediately sit down and give thanks and say a prayer to God for letting them run this race. And the others in the crowd are cheering them on. Some have maybe decided, ah, uh, you know, I don't really want to run, and cheering's kind of boring. I'm going to go home. And the point is not to feel bad that we're not always running all the time. The point is that our salvation is the starting gun of our life as Christians. We are not to sit and stare up at Jesus all the time every day. If we do, we might get a messenger from the Lord to say, hey, what are you doing? It's time to go run the race. It's time to go and do what Jesus told you to do. Men of Galilee, why are you standing there slack-jawed? Let's go do the work that Jesus has invited us to do, to run the race, not simply to give thanks for the opportunity for a race or to cheer others on in their running. Our salvation is wonderful. It is to define who we are as Christians, but it's the beginning of our work and not the end. There's a, a, a famous name, a famous man from the 20th century, the 1900s, as the kids say. Um, a lot of us were born in the 1900s, um, and now the young people like to talk about, you know, what does it mean to be born with a 1-9 at the beginning of the year? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German. Uh, he was a pastor. He was a theologian. And he's most famous, uh, not just in the church, but around the world today, because he died uh, in a Nazi prison. He died uh, as part of a, uh, a conspiracy, a scheme to, to assassinate Adolf Hitler and end the Nazi regime. And he did not do this lightly. In fact, he admitted and confessed his sin of joining a conspiracy to commit murder. Uh, but he saw it as the last and only good, or at least less evil, option. And so he died in a, a Nazi prison camp shortly before the Allies won and took Berlin. But that's not what he would want to be famous for, I think. Because the very reason that he ever considered even going back to Germany, let alone taking on such an incredible, impossible-seeming task of, of taking out the most powerful man in the world at the time, that he started that. He was known and wanted to be known, I think, for his Christian love. He was a student, uh, a scholar, a theologian, as I've said. He, he went into ministry, and his focus in his writings and his sermons were always on life together, 
In fact, that's probably the most famous book that Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote. He wrote and, and focused a lot on the Christian community and what that was meant to look like. When he was giving his, his thesis in seminary, the focus was on that Christian community. And his thesis statement was something along this line, given in 1927. Jesus is the Lord through whom God's love, the basis and the bond of all community, overcomes sin and brings about the reconciliation of individuals with themselves and of people with one another. In other words, it is Jesus and Jesus' love and work that brings us into community with the person we were meant to be, right? With the holy individual created in God's image, untouched by sin that God created us to be. Jesus restores to us who we are before sin and now beyond sin. Not only that, Jesus restores us to community with one another. We see that in John's Gospel. John is um, writing this in John 17. This is right before the end of Jesus' life. This is, this is the night he was betrayed. This is somewhere um, in that upper room or, or on the way to the garden where Jesus would be betrayed. And it is clear that Jesus is saying these things, and John is writing these things much in the same way that we hear from 1 John. This is not that we might be introduced to Jesus for the first time, that we might come to a place where we believe Jesus is Lord. This is written to people who are in the thick of it, who are suffering for Christ, who are surrounded by people who love and know Jesus and love and know each other, and yet still are dealing with all the problems of the world. Jesus is saying over and over again, Father, you have loved me, and you have sent me, and you have given me these people who are yours and are now mine, and you have put me in the world, and I will not be in the world for very much longer, right? Himmelfart, ascension. But I am sending them into the world. And they are not to be of the world, but they will endure many things that the world throws at them. But I ask, I pray, Father in heaven, that they would be one, just as you and I are one. May they be one even as they go out into the world. That's what Jesus said. That's what John writes about. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer based his entire ministry on. That the church might be one, and as the church goes out into the world, that they might draw more people into that loving community, into that oneness, the oneness with God and the oneness with each other, the unity in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was actually a youth pastor, a youth minister. So, special bond in Nicole. You've got a, a great hero. That's one of the reasons that I always loved him as someone who, even in college, was studying to go into youth ministry. And youth ministry is one of those places where, where the community, the relationship, means so much. It matters. The, the reason I got into youth ministry in the first place is because I was not always, believe it or not, the most popular kid. I know, I'm super cool now, right? But back then, age 14, 15, I was a really awkward nerd. Now I'm a slightly less awkward nerd. But point is, I hated being left out. And it hurt to be left out, to, to not be invited to the party, um, to not feel like you were part of the group. And so I got into youth ministry, and I did camp ministry and, and, and VBS and all these things because I wanted to make sure that every kid that I encountered knew that God loved them, and not only that God loved them, but they had a place. That they had a, a part to play in the group that I was leading. That they mattered. In fact, that the group needed them and would not be the same without them. And I believe Dietrich Bonhoeffer believed the same thing. It's why he got into ministry. He saw that, that unity in Christ, 
that restored relationship with God that comes through Christ's salvation, but then needs to be enacted in the local church. Over and over again, he described the local church as the place where God's love does its work and where the church is invited to join in and carry that love and do that work. Dietrich Bonhoeffer saw everything happening in Germany as the, the Nazi party came to power and began to exclude, harm, and blame all of Germany's problems on outsider groups, on Jews and homosexuals, gypsies and immigrants. They were the scapegoats for all of Germany's problems. And they began to be persecuted hated, and members of the government under Nazi regime and even members of the church began to encourage others to place that hate on those groups, to harm those individuals, to lock them up, and worse. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had formed all of these relationships in, in America where he was a pastor and a teacher and a professor, hated the idea of leaving that behind, felt that God had called him and placed him to be in that local church where he found himself, to be doing the work of Christ, growing the relationships of the church community. But he saw in his home country these terrible things happening, often in the name of Jesus, and felt he had to do something. He had to risk his life and go back to Germany to speak out against all these things that the Nazis were doing all the things that his home country and even his home church were getting wrong and disrupting the very message of salvation and of community and life together. Our word today makes it clear that we are to love each other so much that the world sees us. When they look at the church, they see us as one body united in our care for one another, and our hospitality for one another. I'm grateful that Dave Dredoppel was the only one to go to Presbytery. Not, not because I wanted more to come with us. I do. I did. But now I'm going to be stealing some things from Friday night's sermon. And Dave's the only one who has to hear them twice. It was a really good sermon. I wish we had more people that went to Presbytery, but at least now, Dave, you're the only one who's, who's hearing double. Uh, but Pastor Philip, the pastor uh, there in, in Wenatchee, at Saddle Rock Presbyterian Church, get an incredible message. And he was talking specifically about hospitality. And he was talking about hospitality within the church and also outside the church. And he used a message from Tim Keller. Tim Keller was a, a fantastic Presbyterian pastor uh, in New York City. He, uh, he planted and grew a church that was absolutely astounding in its size and in its reach and in its mission. It continues to bless bless the city there. But uh, at one point, they had a, a gang member come and join the church, uh, come to Christ, be baptized, and, uh, and really turned his life around. And at some point, the, this, this man stopped coming to church every Sunday. You know, Tim saw him less and less and less. And he bumped into the guy, you know, on the street, maybe outside a coffee shop or a hot dog stand, and he said, hey, you know, wh why don't you come to church anymore? And the gang member said, when I first came to faith, I thought church was going to be like the gang. I thought you were going to be there for me every day and in every part of my life. But I realized that so much of the church is only there on Sunday and isn't really there for each other the way the gang was there for me. And we don't know the rest of the story if, if that was you know, a moment that Tim doubled down and, and had his session really refocus on, on what life in the church was supposed to mean. But that is a, a condemning statement, a true statement that reminds us of how church is supposed to be so much more than just Sunday morning. If a gangster can come to Christ and be baptized, but then slowly drift away, because he does not experience the love of a community in the church the way he did in a gang, 
that we have some work to do. We talked a little bit about, I mentioned the, the honeymoon period, right? And, and the honeymoon period goes both ways. I, I've been intentional this first year of ministry in, in trying to, to walk slowly, in trying to, to make sure that nothing gets so upset that it seems like anything is happening too fast or being changed too abruptly. But at the same time, I see things that I want us to do as a church better, or I want us as a church just to do. One of those things that I've been talking about and praying about, and we've been beginning to talk about it at session, and we've made some moves, but I think there's more for us to do, is life groups. And we have some wonderful life groups, and some more have been started in the last few months, and some others are going to be gearing up soon. But I also recognize that even with the life groups we have, there's room for more people in each of them. There's room for people to, to gather together and do life together, to love each other on more than just a salutary Sunday morning greeting kind of way. There's a, a culture that we live in in this world, right? And, and I say world in the same way that Jesus talks about the world in John 17, kind of the, the human world that is outside of God's holiness. And that culture that we have in our country is very individualistic. We celebrate the rugged individual. We want to be able to do all things by ourselves. Amber touched on that when she talked about the, the wildland firefighters, right? We celebrate that kind of strength, that kind of uh, ability to do incredibly hard things. But the truth is we're not very rugged individuals. We certainly are not in the faith. It's not about me and Jesus and the Bible. It's about us and Jesus. And we cannot do this thing called faith without each other. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that means holding your nose and forgiving someone even when maybe they don't deserve that forgiveness. But of course, Jesus says, Nobody deserves my forgiveness. But that's all the reason why I'm forgiving you. We are defined by, as Christians by our love. The love that we receive from Jesus and hopefully by the love that we give to one another. And if we're only giving and receiving that love when we see each other, and if we're only seeing each other once a week, once a month, maybe once every few months, then we're missing a lot of what Jesus has to give. So I would encourage you to think about, think about your life last week, this week, next week. Where are some ways, where are some places where you can be not only in prayer, receiving what Jesus has for you through study of God's word, through prayer in that quiet holy space with God, but also how you might be receiving and giving the love of Christ in community with the people around you, the people next to you in that pew. And if you have questions about that, I am here to talk to you about it. I'm here to tell you about those opportunities. And I would also encourage you to check out the bulletin, the newsletter, the calendar. There are things happening in this church and with this church around our community all week long. Pastor Phil on Friday night, as part of his sermon, read from 1 Peter 4, beginning at verse 7. Peter writes to the church, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. 
Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter literally is telling the church, the end of all things is at hand, right? We are at the end of the age. God is working and Jesus is coming soon. The world might end next week, tomorrow. What does he tell us to do? To build a bomb shelter? To hunker down? To write books of prophecy? Declaring it's going to happen on this day, so circle the wagons? Protect the culture? No. Love one another earnestly. Be hospitable. Welcome others into your home. Last example from Pastor Philip's sermon, he talked about uh, a church planter that he knew, and he was one of the, the most radically hospitable guys that he ever knew, and he said it was one reason, one reason he could point to. Anytime he was having a conversation with somebody new at the church, church that started with 25 people and ended up over 2,000 people, he said, what are you doing for lunch? Come over to my place. Have lunch with me. And he would sit with them and listen to their stories, pray with them, invite them to, to come deeper into the church life. But he never worried about what his house looked like when he invited these people over. Raise your hand if you might not be comfortable right now inviting someone over for lunch today because of what's the state of your house. Okay? See some hands going up. Okay, I, I am the foremost of sinners in that. We have 25 dogs at home. They don't all live inside, but they all come inside sometimes, and we don't always vacuum after they do that. We have unopened mail on the table. Uh, we might have some laundry hanging off the railing of the stairs. Don't go in the guest room. There's all kinds of clean laundry sitting on the guest bed that hasn't been folded yet. There's dishes in the sink. Maybe the first step for radical hospitality, the first step of loving each other, that we might welcome others into Christ's love, is being willing to have people over even when we have the messy house. Maybe because we have a messy house and we can show them that we are certainly not perfect. We don't have everything sorted out and figured out. Our life is not ship shape, but we still want them in it. This is something I've been feeling actively convicted of. I keep putting off inviting people into our home, inviting new people into our home, because I'm self-conscious about what they might think about all that dog hair, all those dirty dishes, that unopened mail at the corner of the dining table. So radical hospitality, radical love that we have already received from Jesus has to start somewhere. Our salvation is the beginning, not the end. How do we show God's salvation? How do we show love and radical hospitality to the people in our church and then to the people outside the church? It has to start somewhere. Maybe it's joining a life group. Maybe it's coming on Wednesday and helping with food boxes. Maybe it's inviting or going over to someone's house even when there's not a clean house waiting for them. But Jesus makes it clear. He and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. And their love is what began creation. It's what restored us as creating beings marked and marred by sin into that loving relationship with God. And now it's up to us to receive that love and to grow and show that love by extending our lives out to others. May we be so bold to do it. Amen. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Help us to be your church, to be shaped by you, to be guided by your word, not to stand slack-jawed 
waiting for you to tell us what to do because you have already told us what to do. You have told us to go, to be bold, to welcome others into our home, even when our lives and our homes aren't as neat and tidy as we would like to show. So God, we ask that your love and your spirit would be in us, that we might grow in what you have told us to do, that we might grow as your disciples, and that others might come to know your saving grace, Jesus, by how we love them. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please stand for our last song. May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your you your reservation for Mother's Day, but at the very least, we've got some chocolate calories for you. Uh, Kids are going to be distributing candy bars to all the women, so may the peace of Christ go with you wherever he's sending you. May Christ guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm, and may Christ bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he's shown you. May Christ bring you home rejoicing once again, and to our doors, go in peace.